Nick Flanagan here. He's a body composition coach. We're going to talk a little bit about strength and conditioning, a little bit about fat loss, a little bit about muscle gain, uh, something that you know a little bit about. Jake, you want to introduce yourself to the Grit Gym Tribe? Hi, guys. I'm um, basically a body composition coach. I teach in nutrition, uh, predominantly in functional nutrition, which is integrating functional medicine into the health and fitness industry. So I'm teaching like that. UK, yeah. Dubai, setting up Hong Kong. I'm, I'm, I'm taking it global now. And it's really looking at the kind of physiological prerequisites, what people need to work with and address to maximize body compositional change. Now, it's, it's doing things what people don't really want to do, such as looking at their health and addressing the health, fixing the sleep, fixing the stress, fixing the gut. And by doing this, we actually get much better synergy and efficiency so we can respond to what we actually want to get out of our training so we can actually get these adaptations we can actually feel better in the morning we get better energy don't, we don't get tired in the afternoon we get better sleep but as a byproduct we start looking good too yeah how do you say that you say good gut 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah that's it a, a silly americans no i like that like uh it sounds like how you approach nutrition is a lot how we approach strength and conditioning it's like you do it by design it's not by chance it's by design right yeah yeah and we, we the thing is we have to really understand everyone's individual and yeah. assess them across all systems, you know, not just looking at, right, okay, it's calories in, calories out, because it's not. I mean, that, that's still a factor, right? Oh, 100%, but, yeah. But it's, that's like a variable factor, which can be influenced right. across a multitude of different variables. So we yeah. have stuff like the microbial status, the, the neurological status, the physiological status, which will all manipulate this, this outcome, this, this formula, so just by looking at someone's physiology, their health, the gut health, you know, their, their insulin sensitivity, the mitochondrial efficiency, the nutrient reserves, everything, and looking at every different system and working effectively with that and getting the body working together rather than against it, right? we get the, out, the outcome what we really desire with great yeah. degree as well. Yeah, I think you're, you're like, especially with the, there's so many variables. Uh, I get the, the calories, in, like so many stuff, so much stuff on the internet is just, it's all about like it, like calories in, calories out, no matter what. Like if you eat this many calories, or if, what's the one? You eat uh, 250 calories less per, per day or 500 calories less oh, per day. One, you're going to you're gonna lose one pound of fat per week. Yeah. I'm just like, that is not accurate. There's so many other factors that can go into that. And and just like what you said, like it's totally manipulative. Like you can manipulate so much stuff uh, from your from your sleep. Uh, there's so many factors like your sleep, your gut health, your like uh, – yeah, what you're actually doing in the gym. That's, that's the thing, right? So if, if we look at uh, firmicute ratios, if we have more firmicutes, we actually get more lipid droplets from fat, so we actually get more calories. Or say, for instance, if someone has a thiamine deficiency, right? Because that could, they could have a thiamine deficiency from certain G DNA and genes. But sure. if, if they have this deficiency, they have an inability to convert pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, and then acetyl-CoA won't work through the citric acid cycle. They can't right. produce NADH and FADH, which then won't go into the electron transport chain as effectively to produce the ATP, what we desire, just from a B vitamin deficiency. Or let's look at candida, right? If someone has a candida overgrowth, it will produce um, tartaric acid as a byproduct, right? And tartaric acid is an analog of malic acid. It looks similar. Like if you look at the structure, you've got malic acid and you've got tartaric acid. They look identical. Now, fumarase, which produces malic acid, will notify that there's tartaric acid there. And think, okay, cool. We don't need to produce any malic acid. So it shuts down its efficiency again. So just by having candida, you shut down the efficiency of the citric acid cycle, which shuts down the body's ability to produce energy as effectively. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, it's been a long time since I've heard of acetyl coa Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah. No. 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 That's great. That's fucking. That's great. Great stuff. Uh, can you get? Can you back it out just a little bit and give us like the thirty thousand foot view? Like when you say candida, like can you do, like just give the the background yeah, on that real yeah, quick? Yeah. That's my th I'll, I'll jump deep into the science, but you <laughs> can just tell me. So, yeah. candida is a basically a, a bacterial like um, pathogen inside us. It's like a fungus, which we don't really want to have. Okay, right. we'll have yeah. but we don't want an excess. That's for sure. And yeah, that's a good distinction. Uh, like, pardon? Like, it's a good distinction. Like, we don't want it in excess. Like, we don't want too much of it. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I mean, yeah. we we have back a lot of bacteria studies right. say either anywhere from 90 percent to 70 percent of our bodies is bacteria 
Okay, so that's, that's a lot. So we need an endosymbiotic relationship. We need it to be working with one another. And it gets heavily overlooked. Now, we, we need this bacteria to, to do certain functions and help us regulate our immunity, our inflammation, and it can assist us with basically breaking, breaking down food to some degree. But when we have the wrong ones or too much of the good ones and not enough of the good ones, then it places stress in the body. When we get yeah. stressed in the body, we get dysfunctions and yeah. deficiencies and diseases manifest. And, and there's a whole number of infinite mechanisms. So, I mean, we won't even know. Probably, we probably don't even know 10% of what happens. Oh, yeah. 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 I, think, I think like we're just scratching the surface of your body right now. Like, that sounds funny. Uh, you there? We just froze up a little bit. But... Bias relationship. What's that? We just cut out a little bit. What'd you say? Uh, we, we need a working relationship with the bugs in our stomach yeah. and ourselves. So we don't want it to become biased because that's when issues start to manifest. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. And I think you're spot on when you say like, uh, like we don't know, like, like, I think I personally think like we're just scratching the surface of what we know. Yeah. Yeah. Massively. Like, like, like in, and right now where technology is and the number of people that are getting sick and that like just the, if you just took diabetes, I mean, like we get a ton of, we're getting a ton of data right now that we've never been able to grab before. So it's, it's going to, the next 10 years are going to be really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. And the, the, it's we're kind of like at a tipping point where the health is even going to go terrible or it's going to get that bad so quick. We, we get, we get good again, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm really curious to see because I mean, humans are extremely resilient. Yeah, so they, like they, we've lived on basically yeah. anything. You know, like any diet out there, there's, some, there's probably some poor guy out there that's lived on nothing but oysters for like decades. Yeah. You know? well, if, you, if you looked at, I think it was, they looked at um, like the traditional Japanese culture, they used to eat a lot of raw seaweed. And this yeah. actually made their bacteria so good and functional uh, because of the bacteria in the raw seaweed. But if people, if we ate it now, we'd get ill. Yeah. yeah it's not, a, not something with it that we, we can handle right now. No, no, no. Yeah, that's uh. So, what's your take? So, like, go with the raw thing. What's your take on the raw food diet? Um. Well, th th this is the thing, right? So, like, ev everyone is completely individual. Yeah. So after, like, for, for instance, with me, I don't do good with fat because I mean, sure. on my DNA, I've got certain DNA. I won't get into the DNA. <laughs> but, like, <laughs> there's there's certain sides, uh, certain things with my DNA which stop me from using fat as well. In traditional Chinese medicine, with my um, gallbladder line. Uh, th there's adhesions along it, which kind of uh, oh, right. correlates with bile insufficiency. And then on my blood work, my bilirubin was high, got elevated liver markers. And then subjective okay. questions as well, like um, like I, when I have fats, uh, I get poor cognition, I get water retention. So for instance, for me, I do really good on a high carb diet, which is brilliant. I mean, like everyone loves carbs, but <laughs> you ask someone else. If they have a high carb diet, they might be falling asleep. They might they might be getting bloating, you know. So it, right. it, in terms of a diet, like the the best diet is one which is going to give you the results you want. Right. You're going to get healthy from, and that you're enjoying, that you adhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah, that's why, that's why. Like the first thing that we always talk about is it's always adherence. Until we, until we get by with it, like until we actually get like some adherence, like we're not going to make any strides. Oh. Like we have, for, for one, you have nothing to test off of, right? Like. Yeah, I mean, so, you could have the best plan in the world, but if no one's going to do it or stick to it, it's yeah. pointless. Yeah, and a lot of stuff will work if you work at it, you know? So, like, what's, uh, like, what's working for you? But, um, so, what's some of your thoughts, like, getting down to the, like, general fat loss versus uh, muscle gain? Like, can we do both at once? Yeah, yeah you can. Uh, but, but it depends on the question, right? You yeah. can't. You can't specifically lose fat and build muscle in the same millisecond. Right. right. But we go through fluctuations throughout the day of when we would put on muscle or drop fat. And we can manipulate it so we can lose fat effectively and still put on muscle effectively in the same kind of meso macro cycle or whatever you want to call it or day. Um, but down to the millisecond, technically no. But yeah. to the end of the day, yeah. So what are some things that people can do, like just a couple different things people can do if they're focusing on fat loss? You there? I think we froze up again. It only had to go, where the, the signal only has to go like, like, uh, like a thousand miles to get to you, so. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, but no, what are some things uh, like if we're talking, we're, we're talking fat loss, what are some like, uh, I mean, how would you take, I, cause I, I, I can't structure the question because there's, there's so many different variables that we'd have to go into, but what are some just typical, like some general things that people can do from a fat loss category that you do with your clients first thing? I think we froze up again. Oh man. Right. I think I call I think I call that question. What are some typical <laughs> things what people can do from a fat loss perspective? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay, so <laughs> right. So uh, <laughs> um first of all, we've we got we've got to master the basics and I, I've just done yeah. a post yeah. today on Instagram about this. Cool. So we, we, we don't think right. I mean, we have like anywhere from 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts a day. And I believe it's nine, about 90% of repetitive thoughts, what we had yesterday. And it's up to 8% of negative thoughts. So just by changing how we think, we'll yeah. change our whole stress tolerance, our perception, our attitude, our positivity, and our happiness. Now, that yeah. alone is going to be a big factor for a change in our hormonal shift, our energy, and, and our quality of life, right? Because... Yeah. It, it, it's all good and well being rich, but if you're not happy, if you have <laughs> negative thoughts, it's not that cool. Yeah. Now, that's the first one. Now, second, we've got, we've got to make sure we're breathing okay because most people have an inverted breathing pattern, right? We're stressed, we, 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 we're rounded over, we're working at desks like this. And now, this is promoting an internal rotation of the shoulder, and, and if we're stressed, to pull your shoulders up and forward to protect the heart and the lungs as a self-safety mechanism because that's where you've got these vital organs, right? And you need to keep them alive. And it will restrict the rib cage um, capacity to actually expand. So therefore, the, the lungs can't take in as much oxygen. We don't get as much oxygen. We, we're not feeding our cellular respiration, which affects every system in our body. And not just that, but if we have shallow breathing, short breathing, then we're going to have an abundance of carbon dioxide, which is the toxin to the body, and that's going to create oxidative stress. So first two things, we've got to think right and breathe right, the, the most basic things. Next, yeah. we have to move. So most people don't move, and practice makes permanent, not perfect. So we'll be sat down in poor dysfunctional patterns, such as in a chair where we'll get weak hip flexors, we'll get a lot of pressure going through our lumbar spine, and this would create stress on the body again. So movement breaks are key. And not just movement breaks, but increasing our needs, our non-exercise non activity thermogenesis. So making sure we're getting like 10,000 steps a day. And you don't have to do that on a treadmill. You can go outside, walk through the woods, get some oxygen, get some biomagnetic energy, get some sunlight. That's yeah. going to be great. After that, we've got to make sure we're eating right. So, so this is interesting. So not, I don't want to cut you off because I want you to keep going here. But it's number four before you even mention food. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the, like that's how big of a deal these other things are. Because if if, if we if we're not thinking right, we're stressed. Okay, if we're stressed, yeah. then our body goes into flight and fight mode. It's not yeah. in rest and digest. So right. we could not even be digesting and assimilating our food, even right. if we eat good food. You know, if we're overly stressed, if we're thinking negative thoughts, if we're we're thinking repetitive thoughts, if we have anxiety or depression, our digestion is going to be diminished. And therefore, yeah. the food, what we're trying to get nutrients from, we're not. Because we've got decreased peristalsis, which is the movement of food through the intestines. We'll have increased cortisol, increased histamines, therefore more leaky gut. We'll have decreased HCL, so less stomach acid. So already that's an issue. And then obviously oxygen is going to be in there because we, we, if we don't breathe, we die, right? Yeah, so, yeah. That, that's fairly key. important, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. that breathing thing. Yeah. But um, I... But I think that's it. like really interesting. Like, like just the, um, like you stated some things in there that I think are just genius, but like the underestimation of all of those, Oh, we froze up again. Uh, the underestimation of the, the mindset and the breathing. Um, what was the third one that you said? Uh, I, Oh, just moving around. It's huge. You back. <laughs> Keep cutting in and out. Yeah, Maybe if I was ma freeze. Yeah, we're frozen up. We're going back and forth. The internet must be going in and out. Um, but anyway, what were you just saying? Yeah, so, so we've got think, breathe, move, and then eat. So then, then eat. we have to make sure we're eating right. And that's just not just the quality food or the right proportions, but we also got the eating practices, such as making sure we don't eat in a work zone and we eat in a designated eating zone, making sure we chew our food, making can sure... You, can you explain we, that for a second? What's the yeah, difference sure, between a, a work zone and a designated eating zone? 
Okay. So can you explain that? Because I think that's probably going to fly over. People are going to be like, oh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. No, like, I think that's huge. Or it's yeah, a really so easy one to slip up on anyway. That's it, right? Most people, they'll eat where they work, right? And if, if you're, you're working like, what, eight hours a day or something, your, your body adapts to this and it will become mentally and physiologically aroused to work, right? So you're in this, this state of stimulation, which would therefore decrease the body's ability to digest and assimilate the food. So having a designating uh, zone where you just eat, then your body will have this environmental stimuli so you can actually digest the food much more effectively. And then we have to make sure we chew the food. So studies show that chewing the food roughly 40 times, we have better induction of satiety, so a better feeling of fullness, and we release more cholecystic kinin, which is a digestive hormone responsible for the release of other digestive hormones such as bile and pancreatic enzymes. So, you know, we don't chew, we just chew and swallow, that's it. But we don't actually chew the food until it's liquidated and emulsified. And, and that's key as well because we're mixing in uh, digestive enzymes from our saliva, such as succarase and amylase, which can yeah. help with carbs. And we're mixing our RNA and our DNA from our own saliva with the food so we're less likely to have an inflammatory response. So our eating practices are out of whack. And then we're eating the wrong foods, you know. So we're, we're, we're shown on TV, like we see like what McDonald's, we see Mars bar, we see all these like bad food. Which I is mean, it, to make us you could even food. go all the way to like Dr. Oz, like the, the garbage information that you hear on the on TV is just insane. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But we never see a broccoli advert, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, we have to then be making the right choices of food. Yeah. So th that, that's key, you know, and making sure that we, we are eating in a deficit. But it doesn't just stop there because we have to make sure we have the right social support network and then that we're actually em emotionally, uh, we've got good emotional well-being because that's a yeah. big factor too. Yeah. And um, making sure that we, uh, we're, we're excreting properly. So e even if we're eating food, we're, we're moving, we're breathing, we're thinking right and we're doing all this stuff. But if we're not actually getting rid of it, it's going to accumulate inside us, produce toxins. It will get... Well, it is toxic, yeah. You know, and, and it can increase TBG, which is thyroid binding globulin. Uh, it can cause all these issues on physiology, which aren't cool. And then last but not least, we have to make sure we're drinking, right? So most people, they don't drink the right stuff or they don't just drink enough. So they're the kind of fundamentals, what we have to get in place in order to make sure we're, we're getting any, any goal, any results. They're the fundamentals, the basics. Yeah, cool. Um, dude, I love that. Like, that's that, like, I think you're, you're spot on. I think that's genius. Like, um, and those are just things that everybody can, can implement on some level. Like you can create details within each one of those. Right. Yeah. 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 You can break it down. But 30,000 foot view, that's just like apply it. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, definitely. And how much would you change in that when you're talking to someone that's like, dude, I just want to get yoked. I just want to get big. I just want to get massive. Okay. So there's still, there's still need these, these, I call them the physiological prerequisites. Yeah, because yeah. They, they still need these fundamentals, right? But if, if someone's wanting to get big, well, first of all, they'll have to make sure that they're lean first because you can't just bulk or anything like this. You, you, you want your body to be efficient. So if you have more fat, for instance, you, you have less testosterone, you have more estrogen, you're more insulin resistant, so therefore we're not using carbs as good. Uh, we have more inflammation, we have more stress in the body. So, you know, we, we have to make sure your body has the prerequisites and the setup in order to get big or jacked right. or hen yeah. or anything yeah. like this. So we, we, need, we need to make sure that individual can, is lean, like probably like 16% body fat or less. You know, if, if you can see all your abs roughly at least, okay, that, that's, that's, then we can consider putting on muscle. If you can't, you're not in that fortunate state where you can unfortunately so we, there's this stuff what we're gonna have to do first yeah and what do you say to the, the people who are like uh in this uh be happy that you're fat kind of movement that's going on right now that's like uh you shouldn't you shouldn't have to be uh you shouldn't have to be skinny yeah well that, you know what i'm saying i'm yeah, trying not to do the fat shaming thing versus the accountability thing like there is so much like i'm trying not to stay away from like like the whole social side of it but on some level like like being over uh, at some point being having too much fat in your body is not healthy no matter what well fat's right. classed as uh, being obese is classed as the disease yeah okay so it's it's like saying it's okay if you're if you have flu you don't have to worry about getting rid of it just be happy <laughs> which, which isn't you wouldn't think like that or you wouldn't think right okay, having celiac 
don't worry about that. Just be happy. <laughs> in a way, in a way, yeah, it's good that you're going to be happy, right? Yeah, that, be that, that, being that, positive. That, yeah. Number one, right? So, so in terms of like, I always, I always teach at my seminars, uh, the, the found, there's like a foundational kind of pyramid, right? And the bottom of it is happiness, okay? Because sure. like I said, you could be healthy, but if you're not happy, it means jack. What's the point? And then, yeah. and then, then we have health, then we have functionality, then we have performance, and as a byproduct of getting all that, then we have the physique. Now, in terms of, don't worry if you're fat, well, it's, it's, if, are you going to have kids, right? That's number one question. Sure. Because, because if, if the person's obese, okay, and then having kids, it will have a downstream effect onto the epigenetics of their children. So therefore, it's not just their responsibility anymore, but yeah. their children's, you know. Yeah. We know that when a, a mother is pregnant, she will be holding her child in her stomach, but not just that, but when the child's developing, that child will hold all the embryos what it has for its life. So she's holding a grandchild. So whatever that person's eating will have a big influence on her grandchildren and her children. You know, so wow. that's really number one. Yeah. And then another thing is, I, I think it ties down into the education uh, of what can actually happen to the individual uh, when they have an excess of body fat. Now, th there should definitely never be any shaming. There should definitely never be any yeah. shaming. I couldn't agree more, yeah. Yeah, and, and it should always be taken from a, a, a kind of like air of respect and empathy yeah. and compassion. Yeah, now, what the like uh, constructive, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, why well, would you turn someone down for doing something good for themselves? Like, yes, definitely. Really and and, and we, we need to really explain the potential detrimental effects of what yeah. being obese can actually cause. You know, people don't, people aren't aware that the morbidly obese actually have a, um, a they, they, they have 20 years earlier, like off their life. You know, they died yeah. 20 years earlier because they're morbidly yeah. obese. You know, and they, they don't know how the risk factors of the cancer or the diabetes. Uh, and that's just yeah and that's just looking at like the like the internal makings of the like like that's not even considering like joint health uh ability to experience your life uh play on a swing set with your kids you know exactly. like, like run around do stuff you know like, uh, what it's robbing from your actual the life that you're living right now that's it that's it so it ties it really ties down into our responsibility then to right. educate them and once they're fully educated then they they'll it's not a matter of yes or no. It's a matter of, okay, now I realize, so now I'm going to act upon that. Yeah, that's the hope, right? Yeah, is that they take action on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah, I, uh, the, the fat shaming thing is one of those things like, uh, let's fat shame these people into taking action. Like, that's dumb. That's like yeah. just such an ignorant idea. Um, but at the same time, like, how are you going to keep people accountable? Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. Uh, like, that's the education, you know, like making them informed, making them aware. Right, right. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Um, and then can we go into stress a little bit, like, and just like uh, expand on this some some of the science behind stress and, and from your perspective? Yeah, sure. So we, we, first of all, stress isn't just emotional stress. It's any stressor that challenges homeostasis within the body. So this can, could be... Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to ask for examples, but you're going to give them anyway. Yeah, yeah, I'm on it. <laughs> uh, so this could be anything from physical stresses or physiological stresses or emotional stresses or even biomagnetic stresses. So, for instance, we have poor sleep-wake cycles. We could go to bed late at night. We could expose ourselves to blue light on our phones, which yeah. would therefore affect the, something inside the, the brain called the supercharismatic nucleus, which secretes melatonin. So, therefore, we don't have as much melatonin secretion because our body thinks it's daytime, and melatonin is responsible for your quality of sleep. It's responsible for getting you to sleep. It's also responsible for your immunity. So already, just by going on your phone late at night, your laptop or TV after sundown, then we're, we're creating stress on the body. That's just one tiny aspect. Then we have, um, we, we have short sleep. We, we wake up during our sleep. We, we outsource our neurological capability with coffee or stimulants. We eat pro-inflammatory foods. We sit down. We have aches and pains, inflammation. We have worries. We have perfectionism. We have social media. You know, all these are stresses. We have medication. Yeah. We have dysbiosis, which is an imbalance of the bacteria within our gut. You know, all, all of these are stress and they will increase the, the, they'll basically activate the HPA access, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access, which is the stress kind of response. Now, that response hasn't changed, right? But our stresses have. So whenever we have a stressful situation, our body responds in flight or fight mode. It thinks, okay, what's going on? 
what's this? We need to either fight or run away. So right. it increases stuff like cortisol or norepinephrine, which are these stress or chemicals, and they enable us to fight or run away. But it leads to a down regulation in our gut's health because we don't need to digest if we're running away or fighting because right. it shouldn't blood all the way to our extremities, our hands, our feet, so we can fight or run away. It increases histamine, it decreases the movement of food through the bloodstream, and it can it causes the release of glycogen from the liver, which is stored carbohydrates, into the bloodstream, so we have this instantaneous use of glucose. But if we get stressed day in day out, I mean, you can you can drop your, your breakfast on the floor, you forget your packed lunch, you're running late, you hit a traffic light, and you forgot your tie, right? These are all stresses where your yeah. body thinks, okay, I need to fight or run away. But that's not the yeah. case. They're just, they're just minute, tiny stresses which don't require this, this specific physiological shift at all. But every time we get this stress response, it will release this glycogen from the liver into the bloodstream in, in the form of glucose, which will then subsequently cause the release of insulin. So now we have insulin going up and down, up and down, and insulin is this storage hormone, which is designed to store either fat or glycogen inside your muscle. So then we have these fluctuations with our insulin, then we have these fluctuations in our energy because insulin then clears the blood sugar too much, we get low blood sugar, we get dizzy, we get hungry, we crave sugars, we make bad food choices, we'll go for the next quickest available thing, we eat that, blood sugar comes back up, we get stressed and it comes fluctuating, we're chasing cat and tail and we're just going up and down and blood sugar's out of whack, stress is out of whack and it can lead to issues, big, big issues with body composition. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't like, dude. That's like, uh, we're gonna have to pull that portion out of this video and put it up. Yeah, uh, that's that's genius because, like, I think like people underestimate it. Yeah, you know, they don't they don't even realize. Like, uh, you could have had like, oh yeah, today was a great day, and you still had stress in it. Yeah, yeah and that's it. Like, I mean, the norm could be like, uh, your normal could be like a ten on the stress scale. And a, and a really awesome day is five, but it, it's still a five on the stress scale when like actually living your life is like at a two, you know? That's it. Like people have a suboptimal level of standards and they're, they're yeah. so disconnected from their body and their own self-awareness. They're unaware of what they're actually doing to it. They don't know yeah. what good feels like. Yeah. Yeah. yeah normal is bad. Yeah. Right? yeah. Or, well, I, I said that the other way around. Like, like just feeling bad is just the norm. And if yeah. they started to feel good, it'd be like, what's this? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Or yeah. Or, or, they, or, they, or the, the bad is the norm, and then they start to feel normal and think that's good. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Mm. Yeah, that's a good one, too. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's kind of amazing what we're, what we're able to do. Like, it's, uh, it's pretty wild, and just how far it really reaches. So, yeah. um, what practices, do you, do you do any kind of, do you do a float tank, do you do a meditation, do you do a relaxation or uh, breathing techniques or anything like that? Yeah, so uh, basically for my, myself or my clients, for instance, for my clients on the off day, I get them working in. So in traditional Chinese medicine, you have yin and yang. Yeah. So training is very yang, okay? And then we have yin, which is working in our body, okay? So it's stuff like, even stuff like cam chamomile tea, right? That's going to help sure. us relax because it aids with GABA, which is the neurotransmitter responsible for your re relaxation. But I do diaphragmatic breathing, so breathing through my nose. It helps stimulate the parasympathetic rest and digest system right. extending my my torso my, my 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 trunk both forwards and outwards so we can get digestive organs more blood flow so that's sure. going to be great for the digestion but then breathing through the nose for the stress uh, then um i listen to headspace and delta okay. and neural beats delta sure. they're, they're really good the delta stimulating ones um and then walks. I'm, I'm a big, big fan of just, I, I live near like a big river or like oh, cool. a cliff and woods and stuff like that. And I've, I've got a dog. So uh, just going out on walks is big, big, you know, like we, we, we have such a lack of sunlight exposure, uh, poor oxygen intake and biomagnetic energy. We, you know, we're, we're trapped inside. Many people work in buildings, right? Or high rise buildings to make it even worse, where there's an accumulation of, of all these Wi-Fi's, these electronic devices, and they're so distant from the Earth's biomagnetic pull that it, that that alone is a stress on the body. So sure. getting outside in nature and not listening to your phones, not listening to anything, just hearing the birds sing, that's that's a big one, you know. Or e even stroking a dog has been shown to reduce stress. So, yeah. you know, I, I do a number of things. Um, I don't do the flotation tank. And um, I, I have to listen to stuff for, like, relaxation sure. or going on walks. 
because I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, you're aware by now. I'm very like, boom, 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 boom. Like, so, yeah. like, uh, I can't, I can't just like sit and just do nothing because then I start planning stuff. I'll be like, right, okay, I can do this, I yeah. can do that, I can do that. So I've got to be almost busy, busy listening or busy working. Uh, but yeah, and then there's, there's a lot of stuff like I, I take magnesium, which supports catecholamine methyl transferase, which is the enzyme which degrades the stress type chemicals such as dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. Uh, oh, nice. the, the adaptogenic um, herbs and mushrooms. I didn't know that about magnesium. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then I, I take magnesium too. I mean, it's, it's kind of a wonder mi mineral. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think it's using three hundred and fifty different biochemical reactions, or well, over three hundred and fifty. Yeah, it's it's unreal. But, um, yeah. but then, yeah, I have um, like. I, I I like my coffee, so I have coffee <laughs> and then I have decaf later on. But then I, I will have stuff like reishi tea as well in the evening. Yeah, you know, for yeah. adaptogens. Yeah, I have to be careful. I'm pretty sensitive to uh, stimulants. Yeah. So like one cup of coffee, I'm just like, I like just pretty wound up. Yeah. It's kind of nuts. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Though. But, uh, <laughs> I do too. Yeah, I, like like somebody who likes being amped up. Like like you probably like you're about like me. Like just wind wind you up and and, and let you go. Uh, it, it's uh, it, it sometimes it can be a little scary. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. Rachel's got a couple questions. Uh. So we can answer these, and then um. Do you, do, can you see them on here? Rach goes. Can't I can't see them on. Uh, what about when you eat meals? Um. I don't know. Uh, anyway, fat. Uh, what are your thoughts on fasting? And yes. Then, Br yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I'm a big, big advocate of fasting when I don't train, and. Oh, I can, I can go in on this. So it's basically, <laughs> in, just in terms of the digestive system, it's like saying, hey, take the weekend off, right? You've been working hard all your life. Sure. Have the weekend off. You don't have to digest any food. So it allows it to actually start repairing itself. Yeah. And fasting can actually increase certain pathways which allow the production of more mitochondria. So therefore, we have more energy-producing units inside our body. It can also help with our brain health, our cognition. So then we, 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 we're we better at thinking. So whenever I teach, I'll fast. And yeah. my brain will be sharp. Yeah. So it is good. Now, there is some kind of um, stuff to be concerned about or be worried about. It can increase your stress chemicals. So if someone is overly stressed, it's worth avoiding. If someone has... Um, previous uh, eating disorders or a bad relationship with food, you would avoid fasting because they'll see it as a yeah. gateway to their, their results and then they'll stop eating. Uh, or if someone's pregnant because fasting can ramp up the detoxification processes and then you yeah. release yeah. these toxins and the, there's a high chance that the baby can accumulate them. Yeah, that's no, yeah, don't do that. Yeah. We usually, uh, we found that it works like, like in, in just using it with clients, it, it works men typically get a little bit of better results than females do in our experience. I don't know if that's like across the board. I, I've read a little bit of research that would suggest that. Uh, but the, the main way that we use it is more as like a, uh, like a conscious awareness thing. Like how often am I shoving something in my mouth? Um, and then later on, uh, if, we, if we find that people are really very responsive to it, it's like, well, let's just keep using this thing. Why would we, why would we not? You yeah, know? and it, it trains people to realize when they need food or like when they're actually actually hungry and need yeah. new or when it's just habit. Yeah, like when are they just standing in front of the refrigerator just and they're just like, I'm not supposed to eat today. Why would I stand in front of refri the refrigerator? Like it doesn't make any sense. See, so I, I, I'm a big advocate of uh, like 16-hour fast. So like the, yeah. from the night the before 16 hours. So if you eat at 8 o'clock yeah. and then you eat at like 12 the next day. Yeah, I like that too. Um, I've been experimenting, uh, like that's what I typically do. I, I like, I'll eat like seven o'clock at night, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, something like that. And I won't go to the next day sometime in the afternoon. Uh, yeah. I've been experimenting going until uh, a full 24 hours. I don't think it works as well for me. I know a lot of people that swear by it, but I don't know. 16 yeah, hours seems nice. The 24 hours plus mark, it's really good for immunity. So yeah. it upregulates T killer cell response and the, these other kind of immune markers. So if, if you're ill, then it's fantastic. It's really good. And it's good for autophagy, which is the kind of uh, cellular regulation of any dead or unused or insufficient cells. So it helps get rid of them. So in yeah. terms of health, it's fantastic. But yeah. I don't do that in terms of body composition. I just do the 16 hour one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. Um, some of her other, so she goes, Rachel got all kinds of questions. Get used to feeling hungry. Oh, that's not a question. Get used to feeling, get used to the feeling of feeling hungry versus feeling bored. Yes. 
Um, okay, time in between meals. Yeah, like thoughts on that? And anywhere from two to four hours, really. You know, uh, but that that's for, that's for hypertrophy, so putting on muscle. So anywhere from two to four hours, because then we're going to stimulate and work on uh, muscle protein synthesis. But if we have poor gut health, then we may want to space it from five to six hours between meals to stimulate the migrating motor complex to help us eradicate the bad bacteria from our gut. Cool. And then time before, uh, uh, like I think she's been in ingestion, time before and after workouts. Okay, this is a good one. This is a good one. Yeah. So basically, the more, um, the more down-regulated someone's gut health is, the longer I would leave it. So I can leave it up to 90 minutes post-workout because you're going to have all this blood occluded in your muscles away from your digestive organs. You're going to have this increase of inflammation, this increase of histamine, this increase of cortisol, which will therefore lead to uh, an increased likelihood of having leaky gut. So we want all those markers to subside. We want your heart rate to drop and we want the blood to return back to your digestive organs. So therefore, if you do have any issues with bloating, constipation, loose stools, if you do have severe eczema, psoriasis, IBD, IBS, anything like this, leave it 90 minutes. Otherwise, okay. you're not really going to be digesting your food that well, and you're going to be placing more stress on the body, and that's not going to be good. You know, we're going to actually going to be counterproductive. Now, yeah. we, there's practices what we can do such as that relaxation stuff, like the diaphragmatic breathing, the guided meditation, to help us with the promotion of the parasympathetic state so we can actually digest our food better and we could probably shorten it. But even in terms of hypertrophy, I don't mind leaving it 60 minutes after I've finished training because I want those, those interleukin-6 markers and these other inflammatory markers that I've worked so hard for in my training to elevate to actually cause the oxidative damage and stress for my body to then think, okay, cool, what, what's, what's happened here? How come, how come there's all this inflammation? Let's overcompensate and make sure it doesn't happen again. And then you get the adaptations what we desire or want. So like leaving it 60 minutes, it's like just allowing these biochemical processes to actually audit their function and do their job. Sure, yeah. Um, and then what else does she have? And that's, uh, and so you're saying 60, so basically for almost everybody, 60 to 90 minutes is a good idea after workout. What about before workout? Uh, 45 minutes to 90 minutes before. Yeah. Are you, are you mostly looking at that? Like uh, whatever their gut can handle. Like if they get sick during their workout, they probably shouldn't try to oh, push yeah, it out yeah. a little bit further. Is that yeah. what you mean? Getting sick before a workout, then that, that's counterproductive and it, like you want to push your food like a bigger yeah. gap either, either side, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I went to college with a guy that it, uh, every workout that we would ever do before every practice, for every football practice, before every lift, oh, excuse me, before every lift, before everything, he, we'd warm up, he'd go puke, he'd come back yeah. every time. Like, wow. I, yeah, he just had something going on. Yeah. Uh, anyway, but um, reduce, think right, reduce stress, breathe right, move around, all sound like easy steps to get in the right direction. Yes. All right, well, that's all the questions uh, that, that, that she had. She asked a lot of questions today. Nice. Yeah. I always like when people ask questions on here. But, um, but anything that you want to get across, like, like big words of wisdom or anything before we, before we jump off of here? Um, yeah, or any last thoughts? What's that? Yeah, basically, just looking at the basics. You yeah. know, just making sure you're doing the fundamentals right for living, you know, that, yeah. that, that you're happy, first of all, that, that you have the right people around you, that you know what you want, that you are breathing, you're moving, you're eating right, you're drinking. They, they are the core essentials, you know. Yeah. And what I would advise people to do is to look further into gut health because that's heavily overlooked. Look at the right foods, you know, probably avoid gluten, wheat and dairy. And, sure. You know, and, and it's not a matter of just removing it for two weeks. Because, I mean, we know that beta caseomorphins will stay present within the body for two to three months after. So these, these are like what we can actually get and break down from dairy. And they'll still be present after two, three months. It's not until after that time period that we can start to feel better from that. Yeah. So do you suggest doing almost like an elimination diet uh, and just see how it, like do sort of like, like wean yourself off of those and then like wait six months before you reintroduce them? Just, yeah, yeah. Min minimum of three. Minimum of three. Yeah. But, but there's still going to be un undesirable effects from certain foods. So like sure. gluten, it can lead to uh, a lot of neurological issues. So it can decrease blood flow to the brain. De it's been largely associated uh, with lower tryptophan levels, so therefore more depression. Sure. It's had correlations with schizophrenia and gluten. So it's not necessarily a gut-related thing, but the brain. 
and um, you know and pro-inflammatory markers too you know with the wheat as well as the gluten they're going to go up so it might not be uh, you might not be able to assess this on a conscious level it might be happening on a cellular level so just because you're not aware of it doesn't mean it's not happening yeah yeah that's a good point that's a really good point but um well where can people find you what's your what's your uh where can they follow you that's what i should have said yeah um, on Instagram is the best. So Coach Jake Carter. Um, yeah, my, my Instagram is quite live. And uh, I, do have, I do have a website, uh, coachjakecarter.com. Uh, my Facebook's Jake Flanagan Carter. Um, so yeah, either of them. But my Instagram is the one where I post the most uh, content. Awesome. Awesome, man. Well, thanks for taking the time to do this. I know you're a busy guy. I really appreciate it. No, thank you. It's been, it's been a really good opportunity. And I, I, I really appreciate you asking me to come on. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is fantastic. But Anyway, we're going to hop off. Guys, you can uh, follow Jake. Go over to his Instagram. Uh, give him a follow. Uh, his wealth of knowledge. Uh, like, that, was, that was fantastic. I uh, can't wait to push this out to everybody for everybody to listen to. Anyway, thanks for being here, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, see ya. Thank you.